Today we're going to hear from Mr. Sosnitz, who is the artist of all of the work just behind me. Um, Petra is a Individual Excellence Award winner this year for the Ohio Arts Council. Congratulations on that. Um, she lives in Cleveland and is a 20-year teacher for the Cleveland Institute of Art, heading up their foundations, um, which is starting here. So, Petra earned a BFA at CIA and a master's at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. That one always trips me up. And then, um, also like to note that she's an accomplished quilt artist, creates primary grade work in here to paper, which are here, and has um, taken part in a variety of artist in residence programs in New Mexico and Fellowship in Peru. And her work has included the 2017 International Quilt Festival in Chicago and Houston, and is in the collection of the Cleveland Clinic, Progressive Insurance, and Anderson Museum of Contemporary Art and the Museum of International Quilt Art in New Mexico. Whew. Well done, you. Um, without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Petra, who's going to talk to us about her artwork and her history and show us a couple of really neat. Thank you. Hi. Thanks for, for joining today. Um, maybe I'll start by telling you a little bit more about myself. Um, in undergraduate school at the Cleveland Institute of Art, I was actually a sculpture major. Um, so I was always really interested in dimensionality um, and those kinds of forms. Although I had been sewing my whole life because my mother was uh, for a time professional seamstress, so I think I was using a sewing machine, you know, by the time I was in kindergarten. Um, I sewed a lot of my own clothes at that time. I think in junior high I thought I invented bell bottoms, you know, for, for sewing. Um, but by the time I got to art school, um, and somehow I had the association of fabric and sewing with all sorts of things domestic, and I just wanted none of that. Uh, didn't want to have anything to do with that. Um, but nonetheless, um, as I was doing my studies, um, I kept coming back to fabric in various ways. Um, it was uh, a time in Ohio, interestingly, where the art quilt movement was just getting started. Um, a lot was happening um, at the um, Southeastern Cultural Art Center in the Cherry Barn. Uh, was starting to organize quilt shows. Um, and so I really dove into that. And at a certain point, I was also getting kind of sick and tired of heavy sculpture <laughs> um, that I had to move around and, and to store. Um, and somehow I got more and more involved again in fabric. Um, originally, I started with quilt formats, um, sort of exploring traditional quilt formats, and then kind of pushing forward on that a little bit um, to try some experimental things, um, you know, sort of pulling some things from my sculpture background into the work, um, and sort of pushing on the medium a little bit. Um, in the meantime, um, I had gotten really, really interested in patterns, um, the mathematics behind pattern, the origin of pattern, um, and also pattern as metaphor, I mean repetition, um, you know, the idea that uh, it can, you know, a field of pattern when you're looking at it can be kind of a meditation. Um, and the other thing that I really thought about a lot is uh, as you ponder a field of pattern, I, I think it really changes your state of consciousness, not unlike meditation, right? Your mind actually works a little bit differently. Um, at the same time, though, one of the things about pattern, even very complex pattern, part of the intrigue of pattern is trying to figure out how it works, how is it constructed, right? So when you get patterns that are uh, very regular, very uniform, 
understood the pattern, it becomes a little bit less interesting, right? The, the regularity of it becomes predictable. Um, so that's kind of been a challenge for me, this, this um, you know, I draw the pattern, especially active pattern, and at the same time, try to figure out ways to get out of the groove of predictability of the pattern. So interested in things like um, order and disorder, or disrupting patterns, or finding other ways to, to create conflict with, within a pattern. Um, I had also gotten very interested in, um, well, in a number of related issues, landscape architecture. I ended up spending a, a summer at Harvard University exploring landscape architecture and land art in a way. Um, I started, um, had the opportunity to start going to um, Mexico and Guatemala a lot to look at Mayan art and architecture. Um, and part of that um, interest was in, in the structures themselves. Um, again, receiving units, blocks, and so forth of how those forms were constructed. And in the case of Mayan art and architecture, um, also looking at the glyphs and kind of the mystery of these glyphs. And at the time that I started going down there, um, not, you know, there was a minimal amount of, of the glyphs that had been deciphered. Now, of course, um, there have been a number of people who have managed to, to really understand um, the Mayan glyphs, um, which is pretty interesting. But that idea of text in the structure, um, block, monuments, and so forth, was also pretty interesting. Um, and then I got a chance to, with the help of a Fellowship, I got a chance to go to Peru for a year to study Incan architecture and pretty Indian structures. Um, slightly different focus there because they did not have a, a written language like the Mayans, um, and their method of record keeping, um, which I think is referenced in one of these uh, other pieces in the show down here, are these kipun, um, knotted um, bands of string and rope that they, you know, just a really interesting that <clears throat> they were using a textile method um, to, to record. Um, and of course, nobody knows really how those work, but also this really amazing tradition of, of Incan weaving um, from super fine textiles that were like burial shrouds um, to the more complex um, kind of weavings that really played with this idea of of patterning um, and complexity in a way that I liked because it wasn't, it didn't get predictable very quickly, right? There was always more. You could really sink into those patterns. So um, those are some of the things that have informed me. Um, <coughs> at the same time, with, with my own background um, in undergraduate and graduate school in art, I was also um, very, very intrigued by minimal artwork. Um, and again, because of its relationship to almost like a meditative state or a, a different state of consciousness. So I have to say in my own work, um, it has been this kind of two sides of me. It's like minimalist me and Baroque me um, that are in constant debate, you know? Um, so sometimes I will end up with work that ends up being very pared down, and other times I end up going the opposite extreme for a work uh, in work that becomes very complex and, and um, that I can get lost in in a different way. Um, so uh, the work goes in different directions. It's not always just one particular way. And the other um, aspect of that is when I do large, and I still do quilted works, large quilted works, um, that is a very different commitment in terms of time and energy and focus. Um, I just finished a, a quilt that I started in January and finished at the end of April, and I was working a good 10 hours a day steadily. I'm on a sabbatical this spring, so I had the time to do that. Um, 
show you the origin of these. So you're welcome at a certain point to come up and look at these. Um, this is a piece that's made out of sheer fabric. Um, this was actually the origin of the patterning unit that you see. All of these pieces on the wall have one and the same repeating unit, which is kind of this, um, looks like a, a block shape in perspective. And I started with this on a much larger scale, and it was intended to be free hump so that the light passes through it. Now, <clears throat> I, I don't always start out work with some idea of content or meaning exactly. Usually I have an idea of uh, like a visual condition or a visual event that somehow is going through my mind. Um, and yes, I'll be, I'll be thinking about certain things. In this case, um, you know, I had been to Berlin and I had gone uh, to a lot of museums and, and I had seen the Kirtland ruins. And it goes back to my interest in these, these ancient ruins, but I was thinking about how, you know, ancient architecture, the state that we see it in, as opposed to what it might have looked like, you know, and when it was current and, and in use. So the, the idea of, you know, how things change and deteriorate or, you know, give evidence of time, um, that, that kind of move into slow destruction, right? Um, and I was thinking about that and history and the idea of transparency or fading. Um, so I was thinking about the idea of these, these shapes that reference blocks, like building blocks, and at the same time not being really solid anymore. Um, but it was that visual condition or event that I wanted to see first. So the ideas are usually visual in origin, and it's usually not until I'm actually you know, getting more and more involved in making the work that I understand what the content is. So that might be different than, than some other artists. Um, but it's almost as though I'll start with a visual idea, and as I'm working on it, then I sort of become a little bit more conscious of like, oh, now I understand a little bit more about what this piece is about and what direction it's heading. Um, <coughs> I think when I start with very specific ideas, it's usually not quite as successful for me because uh, I'll end up sort of uh, illustrating an, an idea or concept, which uh, I'm not as interested in as the process of discovering while I'm working on it. So the process becomes really, really important to me. Um, and you know, if, uh, uh, when I'm in the studio working, I really become engrossed um, in the work. And, you know, I can be working 10 hours and not realize how much time has passed. And I forget to eat. And, and, but, you know, it's, it's getting in that flow um, and sort of working through problems or issues or whatever as I'm working that really becomes important to me. So this was... This was the origin of this particular shape a number of years ago. Um, and when I made this piece, I had a lot of extra blocks cut out because I, you know, I didn't know how many colors I needed or how many to complete this piece. So uh, a little bit of time went by and I went about back to thinking about those blocks um, and I wanted to explore um, the other possible things I could do with this one, uh, this one repeating unit. Um, I guess I, I want to talk a little bit about, you know, how it links to, to mathematics. I can't say it links in a real logical or clear way, but, uh, and maybe mathematics in terms of calculus, algebra, that's not my forte, but as a sculptor and a visual person, geometry is something that I'm really interested in, um, and the illusions that you can create, right? Uh, illusions of 
dimensionality is so important. So I spent a lot of time with graph paper and watercolors and you know things like that, just exploring what the possibilities are. So I decided to make an exploration um, of all the different ways that I could assemble this one basic block. Um, goes back to that idea of trying to undermine predictability, right? I mean, here you have the same block. It's repeated over and over again. Um, the, the, the pattern is disrupted just by the color in a way, but, but the, the way it's placed, the way they're combined is always the same. So if you look at these words, if you can identify this like blue-green shape there, that's the basic block. And everything that is here is combined of this particular block. The two black ones here are just that block cut in half, right? So it, this is the block. And I realized, you know, from working on this larger piece, that by combining these blocks in different ways, I could create this illusion of dimensionality. Um, and at the same time, I really like the transparency um, because it's, it's almost like rather than, uh, rather than something that's given and solid and unchangeable like blocks in the pyramid, the transparency of the fabric sort of keeps these studies in the realm of possibility in a way, <laughs> if that makes sense. Um, you never know, you know, they're, they're stable enough as a composition and yet they, they seem to, uh, waver in terms of um, how uh, how solid they might or might not be, right? Um, the other aspect of this is, <clears throat> gosh, there's so many things. I don't always know where to start. You'll notice that some of the blocks have these color gradations. Um, that gradation um, is something that I'm very, very interested in. And again, it's almost like a metaphor of of like something is happening, it's not static. There's some sort of change that happens, right? Um, it, it produces a kind of asymmetry or movement. Um, and to me, that's interesting as, as kind of a mature artist. I, um, I teach the freshmen, and I'm teaching all the most basic principles, visual principles, you know, visual language. Um, and it's really interesting to me that uh, the most basic things I teach about color theory, um, you know, all the basic elements of design keep coming back in different ways. Like the first thing I ever learned in art school, and then you, you build experience on that. So as you deal with those things again, um, you know, it keeps getting more and more sophisticated. But those very first elements never go away. But, you know, they always inform my artwork. And I think that's one of the reasons I've always loved teaching freshmen. Um, because these are principles that no matter what direction the students go or what field they're going to go into, uh, <clears throat> those things always come into play. So I was really interested in these gradations. Now, uh, I, I don't have enough time in my life to dye fabric. <laughs> now, that would be a whole other career. Um, and the fabric that I'm using here to get these that is a synthetic fabric. It's usually polyester or acrylic or even nylon. It, it, and that's really hard to dye to begin with. Um, so I you know, am always on the lookout for when I find fabric that has this ombre dye, this gradation of color. Um, and that's kind of where the palette comes from, the color palette, because I'm not creating the colors, I'm finding them. And then that's a whole other challenge, right? But the reason I'm interested in using these very sheer synthetic fabrics is that when you layer them, uh, the weave in those sheer fabrics create moray patterns, those interference patterns that become you know, noticeable more or less depending on the, the particular color and fabric. Um, again, that's another way for me of sort of suggesting it's not static. Something, something, it suggests some kind of movement, right? It's, or, or some, well, in any case, not static. So the moray effect, you can see it pretty well in the, in the black here. Um, 
What happens is if you take these two, it doesn't happen with all sheer fabrics, you have to explore, but if you take two layers of sheer fabric and you offset them a little bit, then those weaves will create interference patterns in certain ways. And I make it permanent by taking two sheer layers and I fuse them together. They make uh, like a real fine nylon webbing. Um, that's designed for sticking things together, right? So I, I put the webbing in between two layers of fabric, and then it gets heat set, and then that moray pattern um, stays in place. Um, and then it was a big experiment in terms of trying to figure out what goes on top, what goes underneath, what kind of a, um, an illusion does it create. Um, and I. You know, they tend to shift a little bit. Usually, these things you can look at them and you'll see perspective maybe shift a little bit. You don't quite know which way is the right way, or you can see it in multiple ways. Um, so that gives it a little bit of energy too. You know, this. this uh, I mean, I didn't really when I started. I didn't anticipate that. That wasn't happening so much in the bigger piece. But when I started isolating the elements. Um, that, that kind of flexibility of a form that looks like blocks, but the ability to kind of shift in space a little bit um, becomes another interesting element to me. And then, uh, because I wanted to, you know, Again, the construction of large quilts is always a major time commitment and effort. And you know, you're sitting at the sewing machine for hours, and your back hurts. So I wanted a, a more precise way of just highlighting the individual uh, compositions that I was getting. Um, so I mounted them on paper, um, and I have a, a whole lot of these explorations now. Um, there's something about kind of the precision of these that I both like and I don't like. <laughs> um, but again, it's that you know minimal me, baroque me kind of arguing back and forth, um, and that's then you know um, I'll tend to move in different directions, to kind of counterbalance. Um, but my ability to continue with this kind of work has a little bit to do with the fabric I find, right? Since I'm not dyeing it or making it. Um, I'm using what I find. Um, so sometimes I have to take uh, breaks from this kind of work because I have to build up my my, my cache of fabrics again before I, I can go further. Um, I did want to show you um, a few more things. Um, and again, this goes back and forth between the different ways that I work. Um, I have pieces like this, but these are all studies for a much larger quilt that I recently finished. Um, that quilt is going to be exhibited in California a year from now for the 50th anniversary of the Hubble telescope. Um, so these were studies, and you can kind of see that this fabric that I'm using in here to, to uh, articulate the hexagons is some of the same kind of fabric that I'm using. So I'm trying uh, a few different ways to present this. Now the final quilt is like six feet by six feet. Um, I was working with a very specific grid. Um, so that goes back to the mathematics and the fascination with mathematics. Um, but, uh, you know, it was me and graph paper. Um, following the grid, trying to figure out how to articulate the different grid lines. Um, to create a sense of space and depth. Um, so this one is a lot about stitching. It's mostly black with uh, different kinds of stitching on it and then some of this kind of fabric that articulates hexagons that maybe almost look like you know celestial bodies. Um, but this, at the bottom, you can see the basic grid. Um, and then this is one of those kinds of grids that you can sort of 
reproduce on a smaller and smaller scale within the bigger grid, picking up on the same line. <coughs> Or looking at, again, this goes back to trying to work with a regular pattern but disturb it in some way or, or show you the, the different possibilities within one pattern in a way that kind of eliminates that predictability. So sort of using different colored thread to articulate the different shapes that appear out of the same grid. This one actually... This one actually is a real nod to mathematics um, because within this grid pattern, I found like mathematical symbols like you know plus minus percentage, um, you know null set things like that. So I just articulated this as a um, these forms just as something that I find inside you know the existing pattern. Um, this was actually a very interesting exploration because this can kind of go on endlessly, you know? <laughs> um, this discovering patterns within patterns. And even something that almost goes back to the structures that bear a resemblance to these blocks. Right? something that starts to look like cat's cradle. So, but this gives you an idea of working process because all, all of these that I've shown you, and I have about, you know, another 10 of these, these were all studies for the big quilt to figure out, like, you know, what is going to be effective, what's going to work. Um, and then, I don't know if you can see it so well in this one, but you can see where all the layers of stitching overlap in the center. On the larger quilt, when you when that happens on the black background, um, you get this visual effect of simultaneous contrast, um, where all that white creates optical fatigue, and it starts like flashing. So <clears throat> on the big quilt, um, the white stitching on the black background adds to that illusion of sort of you know, sky or galaxy, um, because these little white intersections kind of twinkle. Um, so those are things, again, sometimes I forget, you know, even though I, I teach all these visual principles, sometimes I just forget until I discover it in my, in my own work. Um, so when I mentioned before that I, I don't really start the work with a particular, <clears throat> you know, meaning or concept in mind, um, it starts to surface as I work, right, as I put the work together. So, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm talking too much. This usually happens to me the first week of of classes when I'm teaching because I talk too much. Um, so when I when I choose these shapes and the colors, you know, and the particular way of putting them together, I'm really thinking visually. I'm always looking at like, you know, trying to understand what order and why do I want to see it in this particular way. And in this particular case, you know, things start to surface. It's like, oh, okay, maybe the reason I wanted to see this this way is you you realize the, the background issues that you're thinking about at the same time. And um, <clears throat> the idea of climate change was very much in my mind at the, at the time. And so you realize how it surfaces in the work, sort of thinking about, you know, poor water, sky, so they, they take on meaning in that sense, right? It's not there, it's not something I was thinking about or I'm going to design a piece that, you know, addresses uh, climate change, but the, the, the meaning sort of emerges in a way. Um, and the, the, the same thing happens 
Um, you know, when you look at, you start to recognize the patterns of how these blocks link together and fit together. Um, the, the fluidity of some of the patterns, um, or even just the, the illusion of if you get the right colors together, how light works. You know, you can you can create this effect of glow. Um, I think it would be interesting to see this piece free hanging next to these pieces, you know, to compare and com contrast how they work and, and how differently the same kind of block um, can work in a bigger composition like that and then how they're isolated in this manner. The, the precision um, that is kind of apparent in the construction of these not exactly intentional. Um, I just happen to be this kind of person when I, when I work, things come out straight. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, I, sometimes I envy my students who can be very spontaneous and, and you know, make big gestures. And uh, somehow, when I work, that's just the way it comes out. Um, and I, I wish I, I wish almost I had that fluidity to work in a much looser way. Um, so again, working back and forth with some of the bigger pieces and the smaller pieces, I try to find these different ways of ways of working. I'm not sure what all else I can tell you about some of these pieces, but I would love to hear some questions that you might have, or even just some comments. Um, one of the things that's really interesting to me is um, people seem to respond um, a lot to these pieces. Um, and because I'm in the studio making them, I see one thing as the maker, but I'm not always sure what other people see or what they're drawn to in the work. Um, you know, the process is, is I mean, not only are the pieces transparent, but the process is transparent to me because I'm making them. But I think sometimes, uh, you know, how they're made is a mystery to other people, um, and maybe that's something that, that holds people for a while as they, they try to figure this out. Um, but I would, I would be really interested in hearing. Yeah. Um, when you were talking about uh, ancient buildings or ruins and looking at how they look today, and then kind of imagining how they might have looked a long time ago or when they were contemporary. Um, it, it, and, and then making a connection yeah. with these uh, uh, sort of shapes and representation. Um, it just it, it made me think of uh, just the idea of culture and how culture is something that is just in our heads and yeah. it's conceptual. And that um, in a way, you could describe it a couple different ways, but in a way, what these things suggest to me is a kind of platonic, uh, sort, of, uh, sort of a realization of platonic notions of, of shape, of form, yeah. of relationships, of form, to each other, and um, and that is partly, I mean, like the reality behind the physical forms, uh, because all of these things are simply products of our our culture and our, our imagination. Well, that's a that's a really good point. You know, it's it's in some ways, you know, in some ways when you look at this because of their precision. Um, you could, on one hand, say that it represents a kind of ideal, right, or, or an idea. Um, and the difference between the idea, um, which is usually leads to manifestation of actual form in life, right, the ideas first, um, that's part of it, and at the same time, trying to give little hints or gestures in here that move them just
direction, right? Maybe something that you don't see right away, but if you spend a little bit of time looking at them, then you'll notice things like the moray pattern uh, or an overlay of color that, that starts to suggest, wait a minute, that, you know, it's an ideal, but, uh, you know, when, when the ideal um, starts to become something in the real world, something always changes and, and shifts. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I'll just add one little thing to that. Uh-huh. Uh, yeah, to me, it's that idea of, um, of culture always being in a state of flux. Right. It's not something that is definite. It's not something that is exactly one way or another, but it's, again, it's what we're products of in terms of our upbringings and the things that are around us that influence us. Um, so, yeah, these, these representations of shape and form and ideas, uh, to me, it represents the, the fluidity of culture itself. I mean, it's constantly yeah. changing. It's constantly in flux. Well, to, to build on that thought, one of the other areas that I am really incredibly fascinated by, you know, in terms of change in flux, uh, is, you know, contemporary physics, which, of course, I have no background in the kind of math that you need to really understand contemporary physics. Um, the, the theory is very difficult for me to grasp. Uh, um, nonetheless, I'm incredibly fascinated, and I, I read every kind of, you know, physics book that's written for a lay, lay person like me, and usually, uh, you know, I'll read it all the way through, and then I'll start again at the beginning, and maybe by the fourth time of reading it, there are one or two things that really sink in. Um, but the whole idea, just as, as culture is in flux, is, is the, this idea of thinking about the physical world that we live in and how we experience this world in terms of time and space. The really fascinating element is that, you know, modern physics tells us the world is very different than, than the way we experience it, that time is very different, that space is very different, um, that, that, that the, you know, the structure of matter um, it's very fluid, um, and it's all about possibilities um, that eventually, um, you know, take one form or another. To me, that's, that's a really fascinating because of how it relates to consciousness and the different levels of consciousness, and, and the fact that, um, you know, the audience or the viewer, in terms of witnessing certain physical events at the subatomic level or whatever, that that actually changes um, the, the reality um, at that level. It's not something that we perceive in our, in our everyday life as much. Um, but I think about that a lot, um, how that relates to states of consciousness and how, how I might like capture some of those thoughts, whether it's, you know, in something that suggest um, permeability or insubstantiality or, or a temporary nature, um, you know, how the colors are working, the fact that it's not exactly opaque, um, all goes back to, you know, they function metaphorically as well, in a way. So, are there any other questions that you would like to ask? comments? Yeah, I'd love for you to talk a little bit about your process because I know that it's um, perceived knowledge when it's your own knowledge. You're right. So could you explain to us in a bit more detail how exactly you're getting these precise shapes okay. and also what you mean by fuse okay. and all of that kind of stuff. Okay. Yeah, it is. You know, when you're doing it, you forget that you're the one doing it and other people don't have that experience of the making. So again, I start with these, uh, I have sheer fabrics that are mostly synthetic fabrics. Um, and I have, the material is just called fusible web. It comes in a few different forms, but it literally looks like dense spider web. 
made of like fine nylon filaments. Um, so you have two pieces of fabric and you put this fusible web in the middle um, and you iron it or you put it in a steam press and it literally like melts the two layers of fabric together. Right? You have to have the right fabrics because if you have the wrong fabric, the fabric itself can melt, right? Um, so you have to find that balance. But it works with most fabrics. It is much more difficult when you're working with sheer fabrics um, because if it's the wrong kind of usable web, um, that becomes really apparent. So they make different thicknesses um, and densities of this usable web. So that's part of the process, and, and that, there's the first challenge. Um, you never know exactly if it's going to work or not, um, because you can fuse the fabric and you think everything has gone really well, and you set it aside, and the next day you go to use that fabric and you see that air bubbles have formed, right? So that goes right out the window. So several hours that it took to get that ready, now it's gone. Um, but if you've got pieces where the fusible worked, um, the next step is to cut the shapes. And I have, I just make really simple uh, templates of cardboard or plastic. Um, and I trace around the templates to, to get the shape. Um, and then I use, for these, mostly I use a rotary cutter which actually looks like a pizza cutter, except with a razor sharp blade on it. Um, and I can cut along a straight edge. Um, I get more precise edges that way than if I'm doing cuts with the scissors. It depends on the shape. Um, but I will cut the shapes. Um, the way that the shapes are then attached to the paper backing is, uh, in this case, they're attached with, uh, what do you call that stuff? It's like, it's like a double-sided adhesive. It's like, a, a, like, you know, there's double stick tape, only it's exactly the same thing, except it comes in big sheets, and on either side it has a wax paper protection. So you can peel the wax paper off of one side, then you can lay the shape or the fabric down on the, the adhesive, um, you can cut your shape out before or after it's on the adhesive. And then when you're ready to put it on the paper backing, you peel that other um, protective layer off the double stick adhesive and you put it down on the paper. And that's where the next, that's where the next problem comes in. Because as you're working, you can think that everything is working perfectly. Um, you've already thrown away the pieces of multiple pieces of fabric that had the air bubbles in them. Um, you think it's all okay. Now you get it down, you adhere it to the paper, looks great, and you look at it the next day, and suddenly these air bubbles have reappeared, or it wants to wrinkle on the paper. Um, so it's really susceptible to humidity and conditions, um, and the other thing that is a really big problem in doing work like this is lint. <laughs> you, you know, you think you've got like, you know, you're working with a really pale color like yellow. You've fused it. You don't have any air bubbles, but you look at it closely and there's a little piece of black lint. So there's another thing that you throw away. So I guess it does require multiple kind of steps of being demanding about the, the process. Um, and, you know, some things you can live with and some things you can't. Um, but it does, you actually do have to live with these a little bit to know for sure that nothing is going to change, you know. Um, usually when you're in a gallery setting, the, you know, there's a constant in terms of humidity and temperature and so forth. Um, when people get these pieces in there, so far nobody's had trouble with these, but, you know, sometimes three months later, a little wrinkle will appear and you have no idea why, and you move it to another place and it flattens out again. But that's the, the basic process. So it does require, now, 
these don't require quite as precise um, placement of these shapes because once they have the, this double-sided adhesive on them and you want to lay it on the paper, you know, there is a way that you have to do it, starting from one edge and then you kind of roll it and lay it down so that you don't trap air bubbles underneath that. Um, but these are forgiving enough that I can place these individual units on top of each other and if something's off by you know sixteenth of an inch um, th that's not an issue here um, it's a forgiving enough composition that that i can make those moves i've tried a few other compositions um, that there's a limit to my uh, degree of per perfection i can achieve in the studio um, so that becomes another one of the limitations, like, okay, how far can I push this? What can I get it to do? Um, you, know, you know, sometimes you can take advantage of, of ways that layer unexpectedly, and you have to be open to that in the studio, too. Um, I think that's, you know, that's one of the, that's one of the things I tell my students, and sometimes I have to remind myself to take my own advice. Um, you have to let the work talk back to you, right? You can you can have some big plan and you can work and you can, you know everything is going according to plan. You know this is the idea that was in your head and then you look at it later and you go yeah it worked perfectly but boy is it boring. <laughs> you know and that happens when you don't let the work talk back to you. So there has there has to be a time where. Make it, you stick it up on the wall, you try not to be judgmental about it because that's really easy to do. We're all our own worst critics. But you have to give it some time, you know, and then come back and look at it when, when your brain is a little bit cleared up. Um, and you try to be as objective as possible in that process where you can say, okay, I gave it a good shot, but, you know. <clears throat> I really need to work harder, just didn't get there. Or sometimes you hit nirvana and it's perfect, you know. That, that um, sometimes, we all know that is beginner's luck, right? Mm -hmm. I think it's because beginner's luck happens because we're doing something new and our conscious, logical brain isn't familiar enough with it to interfere. And I, I think beginner's luck happens because you're trusting your intuition a little bit more now then you do a few of those, and, and then you, you try to have this intellectual overlay, and that's that's when things get hard, you know? So that's a little bit about the process. I'm also curious, um, in your work, it looks like you try to remove uh, the artist's hand as much as possible, as far as like seeing the, it's so precise, it almost, you know that it's done by hand, but it almost feels machined. And it, it, in these as well, you see these grids and really super complex patterning. When you talk about it, it's all very process-driven, hands done. And I'm curious, uh, do you delve into the digital realm to, to kind of draft out ideas, or do you keep it very um, in hand, and can you describe your reasoning as behind that? Um, well, it's interesting, you know, just you thinking about it and perceiving the work in that way, right? For me, it's all about this. It's all about the tactile connection. Um, and I guess it depends on the body of work. Sometimes you see it more than you see it other times. But it goes back to that, that notion of um, some people can work very splashy and messy and you know, spontaneously. And for whatever reason, when I work, <clears throat> if I'm doing this online, it just comes out straight. I mean, for example, people ask me over and over again in large bees, okay, how did you get that stitching so straight? And I said, I, just did it free and on the sewing machine, right? I mean, that, that's basically what it is. So I guess that, you know, it's just 
the tendency I have. Now, if you take a close look at some of these things, or a really close look, you're going to see all the little things that aren't perfect, or you're going to see the places where the thread broke, or where the line got a little bit crooked. But the overall impact of the images is such that you don't notice them so much, right? I know, I, I know it because, you know, I have a backache for four days because I spent 10 hours just sewing these straight lines, right? But the tactile quality of the work is incredibly important to me. Um, I get to touch these things, and you can too today, later, if you want to come up and touch them. I can touch these things you know, if I make them. But we've all learned, you know, you go to the museum or the gallery, you don't touch the artwork, right? But I'm kind of relying a little bit on uh, the memory that we have. We all have, we're all intimate with fabric. It's next to our skin, right? And there's that whole history. Uh, there's also the history that I think maybe people aren't as aware of now, but um, it goes back to, you know, when I was studying in Peru and, and looking at all those ancient weavings, um, that there was a time when one of the most valuable things, objects, that you could have were textiles, right? Because they were all hand-woven, all the all the thread, all the yarn, all had to be hand spun, right? So to have a very large carpet or rug or a, you know, whatever, that was something that was reserved for royalty, right? Um, that there was uh, incredible value in textiles. Um, and so with, with kind of the, you know, uh, the democratization of, of materials through industrial process, um, now the material itself is, you know, sort of by the wayside. So the shift goes into the process that the artist or the maker is doing, right? Um, it's not in the material anymore. But that memory, that tactile quality, um, that connection to the world is really important to me. Um, I don't work digitally very often. Um, I'm not as good at it as I should be, for one thing. Um, but I, I don't, I don't like, I, I don't like seeing things on the screen. I don't like. Um, for me personally, it's not satisfying, for example, to see digital images printed out. Right? It, it, it's like it has no. There's no texture. There's no materiality to it. So I tend to, you know, I go old school because part of the reason I work with graph paper is I need to, I can sit down and draw a pattern over and over again, but I need to do that to understand exactly how the pattern was constructed. Um, <clears throat> and I think that's the difference. Digitally, you can put all sorts of images together, um, and there's so many things that, you know, you can do in, with the buttons, you know. Um, you can swirl things, you can pixelate things, you, can, you know, but you don't have an understanding, you know, unless you're really a, a geeky programmer, you don't really know how those effects are happening, and you, you don't know what the underlying structure is. So for me to go to graph paper, or to go to drawing, or cut paper, it, it, that's my way of getting a deep understanding of how a pattern works. And then it helps me understand how I might want to manipulate that pattern um, to get away from the predictability. So I know there are people who do great things digitally, but I'm not one of them because I need I need this contact. You know, uh, there are so many ways in which we become ever more removed, right? From you know, even even the difference between writing things by hand and typing on a on a laptop, you know, it's there are these levels of removal that to me aren't comfortable. You know, maybe that makes me old school, I don't know, but I, you know, I like the I like the contact with the materials. It's really important to me. I have begun now, you know, as I was working on this and thinking about this kind of a grid pattern. Um, as opposed to like the, how the moray patterns are working. Um, 
one of the things I want to explore now that is textile-like, but not exactly, is I'm working with window screen, um, metal window screen. I even have some bronze window screen that I found someplace. Um, but I'm starting to manipulate layers of screen now. It requires actual depth instead of, you know, things that are right up next to each other. But I, I get more and more interested in this moiré pattern um, and the optics of that and, and something about the meditative state that that produces when you're pondering those patterns. So who knows, it might be a way of going from my textile back into, you know, uh, relief sculpture or sculptural ideas. Who knows? We'll see. Any other questions? Any other questions? Or? Just some comments. I just like the, I, uh, like the way how you will occupy space in a very, like, uh, dimensional way, so but I can, I mean, if I sit here for a long time and look at these pieces and something comes alive, and yeah, I get the feeling that you come from the sculpture background, or you, yeah. like, uh, everything has to do with um, uh, constructing, like, points uh, in a deep uh, space or something, yeah. you know, like, yeah. yeah. Well, it's interesting that you see that. Yeah. Um, when you were talking about patterns in the mm -hmm. beginning mm -hmm. and um, the meditative aspect of, of the effect of looking at a pattern and, and just now, uh, uh, and then how the idea of uh, understanding a pattern and having it have some sort of logic and people take comfort to some extent. Yeah. And just the repetition right. of patterns and, and forms. Um, but then you said how you like to uh, sort of then make it so that they're not as clear uh -huh. and, and easily read or perceived. Um, wouldn't you say that uh, you, you said that you did some landscape uh, design and architecture? Yeah. Um, wouldn't you say that that's a basic principle of, of uh, aesthetic, something that has aesthetic appeal to it, that it has regularity, but then there's an interruption to that regularity or a variation so that it's not completely monotonous, but has some sort of, I don't know, yeah, uh, no, uh, eccentricity I, or interest to it? Yeah, I, you know, there are times when you, when you want the comfort of a pattern that is predictable and harmonious in that sense, right? Um, maybe the best way for me to explain it is, is when I think about music a little bit. You know, I'm not a musician. I tried, but you know, I don't have that talent. I tried the accordion, I tried the flute, I tried the guitar, that's good stuff. But, you know, if you think about the, the different lines that happen in music, you, you know, you've got a, <clears throat> you've got usually a percussive element, you know, you've got a melody, you've got little grace notes and things that happen, and they're all happening together at different times. And there are things that you recognize, you know, that move through a whole piece, and yet there, there are passages um, where there's a different focus, right? It'll shift. Sometimes you hear this. Sometimes the, the other element will take over. Um, so when you're looking at a at a regular pattern, um, if it's you know it can still be very regular and predictable if it's active enough that it has these elements where you know it's like the difference between like a basic black and white checkerboard, let's say, or, or you know a picnic. Uh, red and white checked picnic blanket, and then patterns that get more complex. As long as there's something that will hold your interest, um, and there's a lot of variation that you can pull into a repeated pattern. I mean, that's what this is. This is a repeated pattern, right? Over and over again, the repetition is the same. But here, I'm trying to change the focus just through the use of color, right? So it's 
It could be something as simple as that. Um, and, and even here, right? It's, it's the same pattern repeated all over again, but I try to find areas of focus maybe that I can highlight, sometimes to reveal the pattern. But I, I do, I think it works both ways, you know? Sometimes we definitely do want that kind of comfort and harmony of, of uh, you know, something that is soothing and there's nothing, you know, that's distorted or irregular that pops out at us. And other times, you know, we want it, you know. It, it, it gives us something to, <clears throat> it's actually a strategy that different artists have used over time. Um, there was an artist named Arakawa whose entire body of work was based on his states, um, so that he would create a composition and he would undermine expectations by little tiny bits. Like, for example, if there's a glove that appeared in his composition, um, either we'd be missing one finger or we'd have six fingers, right? Um, and part of the reason is, um, you know, we're very astute observers, right? I mean, we have to size up the world we live in all the time, you know? What's this big shape over here? Is it dangerous, right? We, we work that way. So what he discovered is that when you build in these, these, these errors, these unexpected mistakes, it holds the viewer's attention, right? Because you're like, wait a minute, what is that? You're trying to figure that out, you're trying to reconcile that. And you know, his idea is that anything that holds a, a viewer's attention to the artwork can only be a good thing, right? So it works in that way too. It takes you off of automatic pilot, and you have to spend time figuring it out. Anything else? No last thoughts for me, but I thank you very, very much for coming and for your interest. I really appreciate it. And feel free, you're the privileged audience today. You can come up and feel and touch these and take a closer look if you like. And folks can see this exhibition until July 6th. All right. So, July 6th. Thank you very much.